In the, in the first letter that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, it was mainly, you remember, to answer some of the questions they had about uh, Jesus' second coming, or uh, I'm not sure they understood the difference between the rapture and the second coming at that point, but they were, they were concerned about what would happen when they died, and because Paul had preached to them, and some of them were dying, and then he was talking about Jesus coming back, well, how is that going to help anybody that's already dead? And they're, they're not going to be benefiting from that. And so Paul was trying to discuss that. And uh, he told them in 1 Thessalonians that Jesus could come at any time. And there would be a catching up of those who were already dead. That's the ones they were worried about. And those who were living would be caught up and taken with him in the air and changed in the twinkling of an eye. Now, some of that's sort of melded together in there, and it's, and it's hard to decipher which is happening what. And then they had these other teachers coming in, telling them, yeah, well, Paul meant this, and he meant that, and it's like fake news nowadays. You know, you don't know what to believe anymore, and these new Christians were wanting to learn. They were very open, and, and Paul was getting really frustrated with the fake news, everybody misquoting what he said and, and uh, redirecting them and confusing them. So <clears throat> some of the teachers had given them some misinformation on what he was teaching. And we're glad that doesn't happen nowadays. His, his greeting then is grace and peace. And like we said, that's, he's already talked about all of that with them before. He greets all of the churches that way. He says, we're, we're praising God for your steadfastness. For your steadfastness. Now this is a notable quality. And uh, I would probably say that I could say that about all of you. Uh, I would Praise God for your steadfastness. Some of you have known the Lord a long time. Doesn't mean you've always had it easy. Doesn't mean always that things have gone easily. But you're still here. You're here this morning. You are steadfast people. You are committed people. You are, you are willing to make the journey with God. And that's what Paul is seeing in these newer believers. They haven't been there as long as you have. But he's seeing their steadfastness, and he's praising God for it. Uh, he's, he's saying, like, you're not going to be a changeable person at every whim and every little thing that comes along. You're, you're steady. You're faithful. Uh, he even uses the word worthy in there. Uh, you're worthy. That makes you worthy. You're steadfast. You're going to hang in for the long haul. And he says, your, your faith is growing, and your love is increasing. So... Let me ask you, some of you have been walking with the Lord a long time. What is it that causes your faith to grow? Answered what? Answered prayers. Answered prayers. That definitely does not hurt faith, does it? No. <laughs> when you see your prayers being answered. How many of you have ever prayed and haven't received an answer to prayer? Or that you, the one you wanted? Uh, that's what you consider God didn't answer me. It's when he doesn't answer you the way you want him to. Uh, we've all had that happen, haven't we? And it can discourage people's faith. I, I remember once as a new pastor, we had, a, we had a couple in the church adopted a little girl, and she had a lot of complications. And, and the Lord put on me the one Sunday that we should pray for healing. I felt God was going to heal her. Very strong. I have no idea where that came from. I didn't bring it on. And so I called the church to pray for her. We prayed for her. We laid hands on her. We did everything. And God didn't heal her, as far as I know at that time. And since then, many years later, and I've seen many things, I know God doesn't always do it at the exact moment when I tell him he should. Uh, he's done that several times and shown me how far off I am. But anyway, it, it sort of damaged my faith a little bit. I did not go home happy that Sunday. I was very discouraged. I probably even said something like, well, God, if that's the way you're going to do I'm not going to preach on healing anymore. I've said that several times, but I'm still preaching on healing. Um, God does it in different ways, different times. He doesn't just make me happy all the time because he does everything I want him to do the way I want him to do it. And I've learned that he's the boss, not me. And that's probably better. We all agree to that, yes. Okay. So anyway, I, I, that was a discouraging thing to my faith. But then at other times, I've prayed, and I've seen him do what he wanted to do through those prayers. 
And those have been times, and, and I've had an experience now for 55, 60 years where I've seen that I have some consistency in my walk with the Lord and I've seen that a new Christian wouldn't have that. They would come to faith, pray one time. If it didn't get answered the way they thought it should, they could lose their faith. But some of you have been walking with the Lord a long time and there's been a consistency in your life. You've seen the way the Lord does answer prayer, doesn't do it always the way you want to, not always the timing you want it in, not always the way you want it in, but you've seen it. If you've walked with him a long time, you've seen that inconsistency and it begins to build your faith. And that's what he says here. Paul says, I see your faith and I see your love. Now, how do you see somebody's love? Are they always smiling? Uh, are they always nice to you? Uh, what? Generosity. Generosity. Yeah. I would think. I would think if a person is loving, they would also be generous. In fact, we get the best part of the problem here in this chapter. Some of the Christians that were new Christians wanted in, to enjoy the generosity of some of the people that had a lot of stuff. And they said, why should we work? These other Christians have all this stuff. Why don't they just share it with us? Jesus is coming tomorrow anyway. And why work? And Paul addresses that. We'll get into that in a minute. But yes, generosity is something there should be. Uh, Barnabas, when he was in Jerusalem, you remember, and the Holy Spirit came on them, he sold some of his property on the island of Cyprus and provided food and things that the people need, the early Christians needed as they were meeting together day after day. Some of them were away from their homes, they didn't have things, and he provided that. That was generosity. Doesn't mean I'm going to take care of you the rest of your life, but, but generosity, yes. Work with your hands. Paul tells them they need to work with their hands. Those who work will eat. <laughs> you don't want to eat, don't work. I mean, it's not like we're just going to hand it to you all the time. But we should be generous. How else do you see love in people? How do you express love? Thoughtfulness and thinking about how to encourage somebody else, how to help somebody else. If somebody else needs something, then helping them mm -hmm. instead of just doing everything for yourself. So this world isn't just about us, is it? And did we have an example of someone who loved us and was willing to make some small sacrifices for us? You see, that's what Jesus sees in you. He sees this peace that passes understanding and he sees this love that he has that is beginning to grow in believers. Now that's why Paul is going to get into what he's going to say in just a minute. When, when Jesus comes back, let me, let me see how far down the line that is, not too far. Paul says God is just, he's going to reward you for your faithfulness. There'll come a day when he will pay back trouble to the troublesome and reward to those who have been faithful. That's in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 5 through 10. Let me read that. Endurance. He's talking about endurance. Do any of you feel like you have to endure sometimes? You just, it's not an exciting day, it's an enduring day. <laughs> That's kind of where I'm at today. Um, all this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you, and will give relief to you who are troubled, and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. Now this, you see you've got to distinguish now, is this the rapture or the second coming? When he's revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels, he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out of the presence of the Lord 
and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes on, and listen to this now on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people so he's coming to judge wickedness and yet he's going to be glorified in the middle of this process by his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed have you believed okay maybe you're not going to be on earth maybe you're coming with him but you're marveling when's the last time you marveled I realize there's difference in gender here because I was thinking of something that I marveled at that some of you could care less about I remember a time when I was up in the mountains and it was snowing it's cold but it was warm in the pickup I was in and I had this great big cup of coffee and we were driving along a logging road that had no tracks on it no one had been there and these big snowflakes were coming down and all of a sudden we saw this big herd of elk go across the road and they were snorting and the, the steam was coming out of their nostrils do you, anybody else have ever seen anything like that I was in Steve's pickup actually so I wasn't even having to drive and here I was looking at this big bull elk cows calves snorting jumping frisky in the snow it was cold but I had my warm cup of coffee and it was deer season so I didn't have to worry about shooting them that made it better even and so here they were they were I was I was uh, marveling marveling at the beauty of those tremendous elk they are beautiful beautiful animals and so we went on up the road and came to the dead end and and we got out of the pickup with our coffee in our hands I don't think we even had our rifles we left them and uh, and a coffee nice cup of coffee warm big snowflakes coming down and down below we could see this whole big herd of elk where they had gathered how many were there Steve I'm going to see if you tell it as honest as I would how many how many oh you can't even tell a good story I think it was at least 75 <laughs> they were beautiful just not upset by us at all just roaming around and you could see that steam coming out of their nostrils and their and their mouth and beautiful beautiful animal now I know that doesn't turn you ladies on so I thought maybe about some beautiful flowers or something maybe you could see a flower in slow motion opening up and developing you guys just tune this out and and maybe some birds singing and maybe a little baby when it's born how, how sweet they are caressed by its mother and caressing its mother and you know those sort of feminine things that I don't know anything about you know you you marvel whatever it is that you marvel at what Paul is saying is you're gonna marvel when you see Jesus coming back you'll be coming with him and you will marvel at his glory I mean it's gonna be better than the elk or the flowers or the babies it's gonna blow you away it's gonna be so far beyond anything you have ever experienced in your life and that's just the beginning of this eternity thing that he is setting up for those who love and serve him a marveling at Jesus riding on his white horse not a donkey angels at his side Paul prays for the believers he prays that God will be glorified in their lives verse 11 I think chapter 1 11 and 12 is that about right somewhere there yeah. mm -hmm. Paul prays the believers that God will be glorified in their life let me ask you when you see people do they see God glorified in your life how does a person 
see God glorified in your life. We live in such a busy, stressful world. We see frustration in the lives of people, don't we? Everywhere. Uh, I, last week I saw people walking down the sidewalk talking to themselves. Of course, you could never tell now with these phones, you know. They could be talking to somebody else on the phone, but some of them, the way they're talking, I think they're talking to themselves or a demon or something. They're Because they're, they're, they're really at it, you know. They, they, some of them live on the corners. And they just really seem pretty frantic with whatever they're discussing and whoever they're discussing it with. And I don't see a peace and a glorifying God in those kind of lives. What do you see? Do you, do you, have you seen anybody lately that you just saw the glory of God in their life? I, I, there's a lady at the retirement center. I see it in all the time. Kathy and I were walking the other day around where they were building the new building. And I said, look, there she is up there. And her name is... Oh, you guys would know her. She's a little, little gal. Lives in the, in the bigger building. She's always bringing flowers to people. Do what? The lady up there. The lady up there. Yeah, up on the balcony. I can't think of her name now. She's always bringing flowers to people. She's always sweet. She's taking people to church on Sunday. Uh, she takes... Doggone it. Well, you wouldn't know her name anyway. But anyway, she is the sweetest lady. Every time I see her... I see the glory of God in her life. I mean, it's not like I'm looking at her. I'm looking at the glory of God in her life. Her life is committed to bringing God glory. I'll think of her name later. You guys would know her. Susan. Susan. Little Susan. You guys wouldn't know her. Next time you see her, you'll know her. will say, hi, Susan, when you see that glory of God in her life. Do they see in us the glory of God or do they see the frustration? Do they see the, pay, the, the peace that passes all understanding? Do they see the grace and the thankfulness in our life because of what Jesus has done for us? Now, now Paul goes on in chapter 2 here. He's back to talking about the second coming of Jesus. And he's telling the people, don't get unsettled or alarmed about all of this stuff. He says, some, some of them thought it may have already come. Some of these fake teachers were coming in and saying, oh, it's already come, you missed it. And, and he's saying, no, 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 no. Before it comes, there will be some things that have to happen. And he says there will be rebellion, the man of lawlessness will come. There's a number of things that are going to happen. Uh, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy reported, report, or letter supposed to have come from us. See, they didn't send it. It's supposed, this is from Paul. This is from Paul. No, it wasn't. This was fake news. Saying that the day of the Lord has already come. You guys missed it. No. He says, don't, don't worry about that. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, we have to have another temple even before that happens. See, the temple had been destroyed. So Paul is saying, don't get excited. It's not happened. It hasn't already happened. It's going to come. You are going to be caught up in the air. But before the end of time comes, they're going to have to build another temple. This man of lawlessness will come, proclaiming himself to be God, setting himself up in the temple. He says, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back, the one who now holds it back, will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. 
Who's holding back all of this lawlessness? Holy Spirit? Christians? Yeah. What's going to happen when the rapture comes? Where are the Christians going to be? Are they going to be here holding back the ban of lawlessness? No. They will be caught up and changed in the twinkling of an eye. Will the Holy Spirit be left here? No. People will be convicted of Christ and come to know Christ right up until the last day. The rapture does not mean that all Christians are taken up. There will be Christians who will murder, and there will be people who will walk into death praising God's name. And people who will do that have to be a Christian. You're not going to. You're not going to walk up to a hangman and say, go ahead, hang me, I believe in Jesus Christ, unless you do. You're not going to say, I will not trade by or sell, and I, I, I will stop working, I'll stop the writing for my family if you don't believe in Christ, if you don't confirm to our abilities. There will be Christians until the day Jesus Christ returns and the mountain splits from the west to the east, and the horses and the angels come down, and the blood runs as deep as a horse's bridles for 200 miles. There will be Christians until that day. And God will continue to ask for repentance until that day. And he says, I want you to repent. I'm sending pestilence to you. I'm sending war to you. you. I'm looking for repentance of people to come to me. And there will be a certain number of Jewish people, basically Messianic Jews, who are leaders in, in bringing people to Christ. At the very last time. The rapture is a nice thought. They're all going to be raptured up and taken out of the devil. But it ain't going to happen that way for a lot of people. Some of us are going to walk through the mire and mud, just like they did in the Old Testament. And he's going to, he's going to say, you want to worship idols? I'm going to open the ground up and swallow you. And that's what's going to happen. Some are going to be open up and swallow So what I understand you saying, Chris, is that at the time when God will come and catch up believers to be within the, Him in the air, He's only catching up some of the believers. If you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, yes. If you don't think anybody's going to go through revelation period or, or torment. Well, he, say, he says He's going to come and catch them up. He, he says the, He will, yes. Okay, so... Well, that's a depending on you're putting that... Mid if you're putting it pre tribulation, mid tribulation, or post tribulation, depending on when you want to have people rise up to meet Christ. But if you read Revelations and you read the book, it basically says that there will be Christians and people being converted to Christianity, and he doesn't want to miss a single soul right up to the last time. I have no doubt that there will be Christians during the tribulation and at the end of the tribulation. And they will be saved at yes. that time. Amen. But I think those that are saved now will be caught up to be with him in the air. That doesn't wipe out the chance for people to believe. Sure. But they will go through. They will have to go through a terrible tribulation that the world has not yet known. Yes. Yes. And, uh, yes. and if anybody wants to stay and be a witness during that time, that's fine with me. But I'm not going to stay during that time. I'm going to go with the caught up. I'm not sure where you're doing there, but yeah. but uh, yes, there will be there will be people saved during the tribulation. They will pay a tremendous cost. I'm not saying there will not be anybody saved during the tribulation, and the Jewish people then will mainly come to the Lord at the end of that time. That's when the Jewish people come. But I'm saying the dead in Christ shall rise first when Christ comes. And those who are alive will be caught up in the air with him. There still will be other people saved after that. If you want to stay and you don't want to be caught up with him in the air, that's fine with me. You can do that. And we'll praise the Lord for your willingness to do that. Okay, you can do that. We'll see how it works out. I bet you hope I'm right, don't you? It's like I said, the people that went to the Baptist church, you know, they one of them believed pre-trib, one of them believed post-trib, and finally the people that believed 
pre-trib left the post-trib church, went across the street to worship with the pre-trib people because they wanted to go to heaven. Yeah, yeah, we'll find out. But but don't let your heart be troubled. He, you know, in First Thessalonians, he deals with that a lot, though. He. Uh, No, he says this other has to come first. But he doesn't say you're going to go through that. He says, if I can find it. Hmm. After that, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel with the trumpet call of the Lord and the dead in Christ will rise first. We all agree with that. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds. That's the dead in Christ. To meet the Lord in the air. And we will be with the Lord forever. Now, he's still coming like a thief in the night when he comes back the next time. And those people aren't looking for him. That's why he's like a thief in the night. They're not prepared. Christ did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, dead or alive, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. Just as, in fact, you are doing. But quit, don't quit working yet. See, they were wanting to quit work go sit on the mountain. And he says, don't do that yet. That's not coming. That's not what I told you. I'm telling you end time stuff, but I'm not telling you that he's coming tomorrow. And so you can sit around, quit working, and freeload off of other people. Stand firm. Hold to these teachings. May you be strengthened. Then he says, pray for us too. To spread the word and to be delivered from wicked men. He was in the middle of being persecuted at the time in Corinth. And he wasn't sure how that was going to come out. But God did, God did hear the prayers of the Thessalonians and he did. You remember he raised up this uh, Roman leader who said he wasn't going to listen to what the Jews were saying. It had nothing to do with what they were doing, and he wasn't going to prosecute Paul for what they were saying. So their prayer was answered by God using a Roman uh, leader to say this is nonsense. And Paul got out of that situation. Well, that's one of the most confusing messages you ever heard on Second Thessalonians, I'm sure. So don't quit working. Be excited. Your salvation draws near. God has good things in store. Greet each other with God's grace and peace that a lot of people won't understand. They'll say, how can you be peaceful in your heart with all of this stuff going on? I just thought of something else you could marvel at, in fact. Those of you who didn't want to marvel at the elk, you could marvel at the little kids going back to school without masks on. Wouldn't that be something to marvel at? People seeing each other's face again. Smiling. Uh, we'll call that the new normal when Jesus comes. <laughs> now, you know, if nothing else, if we could just realize how much God loves us. I mean, we've read the book. We know how we have failed as humankind over and over and over. And yet God still loves us. And not only did they fail, you know, Adam and Eve and the bunch with Noah and the Tower of Babel and all of them, but, but we fail too. We fall short of God's glory. And yet he loves us, he forgives us, he draws us to himself as his children. And I, I pray that, that you and I are able to sense that love that he has for us. And then that love 
will be internalized in us so that it will come out of us to others. You want to talk or are you waving at me? Go ahead. primary theme is God's love. And the love is consistently agape, which is a giving love, not an emotional feel. Good love. It's a giving outside of our self love. Love being a verb in this case. And I think too often when we say God loves you or God loves me, we think of it as a big hug kind of love, or often, or in our culture now, love is more of a, I love my dog, I love my cat, I love child. Not a giving love, a sacrificial love. And too often we, we miss the power of that love that brings grace and peace. Um, Susan Berkman is who you were thinking of, and it's she always is giving love through her actions and through her deeds, because that's how Jesus sacrificed. He gave of his love. Um, Not that you have it settled. I, I think we all have experienced love probably in different ways. And uh, to some of us, there may be more emotion involved in love as well as agape love. Um, it's hard for me to realize, to realize that if Jesus came up and gave me a hug and said, I love you, I wouldn't feel some emotion as well as just, oh, that's your agape love that you have to love me. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe the peace that is ununderstandable maybe the love is a little bit ununderstandable too maybe as human beings we can't fully understand how much that love is and how much that peace is and how willingly God gave that to us and and Jesus was human when he did that he still had his humanity I don't know about you but <clears throat> I think it might be a little difficult for me if people were persecuting me to just say, I'd love to die for you. Um, I'd rather maybe punch you in the nose first <laughs> and then die for you. Um, that's the humanness, you see. But that love that God had, he was willing, even while we were yet sinners, even while we were nasty little folks, he, he loved us, and he died for us. I want that kind of love to come into me so that I can forgive people when they're nasty to me, when they don't act the way they should act to others. I still want to have that love that is beyond my capability to be praying for them instead of wishing curses on them. So we've all got a ways to go, I guess. May the Lord help us. Any comments you have, you can turn that off. I don't think we're going to publicize it anyway. <laughs>